So hello, everybody. Thanks for the warm welcome. Really excited to be here and make you guys UX champions. Um, things that make my life easier is when my developers are advocates for user experience and when my product managers are advocates for user experience. So I have some fun tips tailored to the class that I assume, please correct me if I'm wrong, most of you are looking to get into software engineering, software development type jobs. Generally yeah. accurate. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's generally, <laughs> yep, I'm seeing lots of yeses in the Okay, one aspiring product manager. Aspiring product manager. Awesome, from, awesome. So, okay, so. still very relevant. Still very relevant. Okay, yeah. so um, yeah. Okay, let's let's dig in. That's about me. So um, let me talk to you guys about next slide. How do we figure out our users' needs? Nielsen Norman Group says it's not by listening to our users. What? That makes no sense. So let's see what happens when Dilbert listens to his users. <laughs> So are we a generally chatty, chatty class? <laughs> yeah, yeah, Sounds there's generally cool. a lot of traffic in the <laughs> chat window. Good, okay, I can see the, uh, see the chat going, this is great. So talk to me about where did Dilbert go wrong? Hmm. Okay. Okay. So it's mostly we small, small sample, sample size. size. That's yeah. good. Yep, definitely got a plus one on that. Uh, maybe improper, improper sample, perhaps. We're not sure what his user population is. Very good. Yeah. User bias. Tell me more about that. Feel free to come off mute if you guys want. <laughs> yeah. Users don't know what they want. Very good. Talk to actual users. Uh, he should be talking to actual users if these are just people around him. Very good. He probably didn't talk to any real end users. He implemented everything ever, right? Maybe no sense of prioritization. That's a shout out to the product managers here. Very good. So I'm not saying ignore your users. Nielsen Norman is not saying ignore your users. Examples illustrating what happens when you implement a solution users specifically ask for without using scientific methods to prove out your assumptions. I never ever ask a user flat out what they want or, hey, would you like this thing? Of course they're gonna say yes. Like, yeah, give me that cool thing. So like we're more scientific and, um, uh, um, sneaky about it. So um, this kind of highlights how products fail when too many assumptions are baked into your software. We're talking about that a little bit more going on. So um, we can go two slides forward now, Chris. I think the next slide was our, tell me what you think. Okay, UCD. Let's talk about design thinking. Have we talked, have we talked about design thinking at all yet? No, that's not a phrase that's come up. What? Oh man, okay, so happy I'm here. Okay, everybody. User-centered design is, is in a few courses. That's very good. Okay, I'm glad to hear that. And I hope you guys, this is a little teaser to maybe some of those classes you might be um, interested in checking out. Highly recommend everybody get into software development, solution development. They are familiar with design thinking. They're familiar with user-centered design. These are interchangeable terms. Design thinking is essentially a branded form of user-centered yeah. design. We've talked about things related to that. We just haven't used that particular term. Okay, awesome, awesome. Yeah, so what I wanna to talk to you guys about is these main phases. This is not meant to be linear. This is very iterative. What's just being HCDE and user and design? Literally nothing, just the word interchange. Very good question. So this is not meant to be linear. This is um, simply at any point in the process, if you don't feel you have enough information or you are needing a pivot, you can always circle back. So. I just uh, ran out of time at adding loops everywhere. It'd really be, if it wasn't linear, it'd just be loops all over the place and it would just, it would just mess up the whole, <laughs> the whole graphic. So uh, hang with me here, not linear, but essentially the five minute elements are empathizing with our end users. We have a challenge. How do we approach it? We want to experience our end users in their environment. 
Then we got defining. We've learned something now. How do we interpret it? We want to construct a shared point of view, shared problem statement, define the problem statement. And then ideation is always the fun part. We see an opportunity. What do we want to create? Generating a lot of crazy, wild ideas, brainstorming. Um, how do we want to start thinking about solving that problem? And this is always something um, I always have to uh, coach developers on not to jump into feasibility mindset too early. I'm usually trying to back them off farther down my process. I want to get a good chunk of time to figure out what are the possibilities, get into that abstract thought, creative collaboration before my developer hits me with, this is impossible. I cannot make this for you. <laughs> so we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Prototyping, we have an idea. Now let's start talking about how do we build it? This is when I'm bringing in my developer. What's, what's feasible? What can you do? Um, building, testing concepts, that building to think mentality. And then finally testing, we tried something new. How do we evolve it? Taking our prototypes out or our coded, coded work, whatever level you're at, um, testing that with real end users, getting that real feedback, synthesizing it. So this is all super, super loopy. Um, I'm gonna pause there for questions. So we have one, one in the chat. What's the difference between human-centered design and user-centered design? Zero things. Okay. Okay. Just... Any other question? <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, users aren't human. <laughs> yeah. Nice joke. Uh, definitely don't say that around a UX designer. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, so let's talk about how do we all work together implementing user-centered design. Um, so team, talk to me about who is responsible for a successful product. All of us. This is a slide that it should look very familiar to you. Very Not good. Liz, but to one of the very first classes we had a lectures, we had a slide very much like this. Very good. Very good. Awesome. So yes, we're all responsible for successful product and um, we all get to play a really fun part in helping make stuff that people love. So yes, we're all responsible for creating those solutions. Um, Dev, you're mostly responsible for feasibility. Of course, we all play a part in that, right? I'm mostly responsible for usability and desirability, though you and product have a hand in that. And then product has mostly a responsibility for aligning to those business priorities, the business needs, that's viability. Um, but again, we both play a part in that right now. In my job, I am helping the whole tool suite kind of do a re-level set on those business needs because they weren't done very well, in my opinion. And that's something I need to enable my good work on figuring out user needs validation. So uh, we're always hanging out with each other and I'm excited to share a few more um, tips related to that. But I want to talk to you guys, devs, mostly on getting to know the roles on your team, you know, getting, trying to figure out and developing an appreciation for understanding how to work with UX. That's the main bulk of my talk today. Really excited to share some of these tips with you guys. Um, and then how are you asking good questions of product, of design? How did you arrive at these priorities? How did you arrive at this design? Um, I'm gonna talk to you guys about how to join in those conversations, but obviously the bulk of your work is spent writing code. So you don't get to be, you know, everywhere, but I'll show you some specific touch points that, um, help you build trust better and uh, work on a really high functioning team. Okay, next. All right, please. Okay. So let me talk to you guys a little bit more. Now, one step deeper. What's that operate, oper, words, operate, operational, operational, operational level of user centered design? So this is like literally how it goes on a product increment or whatever you guys want to call it, a sprint. Uh, iteration, product increment, whatever we're calling it. Um, this is kind of our software 
development life cycle, right? Hopefully you're a little familiar with that. Um, what I wanted to highlight is the UX specific pieces of this. So hopefully you guys are seeing how teeny tiny coding is. Obviously it's a huge part of product development, but um, this is the world according to me, according to UX. So I um, want to share with you guys a little bit more uh, specifically around how I help create software and how we kind of hand that off. So starts at scoping. And if you guys want to follow along that, those top bars, basically I'm saying product management, they kind of need to manage everything. Um, but I'm a little bit more up front. You guys are a little bit more in the end. And we kind of dabble on either sides. Uh, ensuring um, a, a high functional team. So again, uh, number one, going to get some scoping going. What are those uh, high level requirements we want to enable or go validate initially? I'm going to go out and be doing an extensive amount of user research to validate all the user needs. What are they working on? Uh, what loopholes have they come up with? And then basically narrow that down to what problems are they facing? What problems do we want to solve? I hope to include dev a teeny tiny bit along that process so that they are able to see what's coming down the pipeline, able to learn firsthand, right? It sometimes is more powerful when you see a user struggle with software you created um, versus me telling you, you know, the user couldn't figure that out. <laughs> and then we got, um, yeah, some planning. Sorry, a little small on my, on my phone. Um, design work, that's the next big chunk. That's where we create the solution. So I want to make sure I'm leading that, but I want to make sure it is a really collaborative activity, right? Deb, I need you guys involved for feasibility, but also just to let you have a little fun and give you a little break from coding, right? You don't want you on the computer all day. Um, if you love it, that's cool too. <laughs> but uh, I can't imagine writing code for eight hours straight. That's crazy. <laughs> but um, Design is like the funnest part for me, and I, I, I desire to see Dev uh, participating in this um, activity as well. And then um, tons of coding is happening, right? This is where DevOps really kind of gets kicked off. I don't spend a ton of time around the DevOps life cycle, but I do play a part in user acceptance testing. If you guys have talked about unit testing or functional testing at all, this is a cousin to that where we conduct usability tests to make sure the users successfully complete their work with the live code. And I present that work back and score our product and um, then we hope at that point, all together, we all give it the thumbs up and that code gets launched. Any questions? Yeah, testing is a topic we cover just a little later in the course. Very good. <clears throat> so user move, move ahead then? Uh, yeah, sounds like it, yeah. Okay. okay. So talking about touch points with you guys in a little bit more detail, uh, user research is all about validating needs. And I want to involve dev early and, you know, at appropriate amount, right? Like you don't need to be at every single user test, but seeing like one or two, it's really nice. Again, give you a little break from coding, but also see what's coming down the pipeline. And then, oh man, my tips are so tidy. Um, so What's your, I can, I can, I can, I can read them. They're easy enough for me. Oh, it's okay, Chris. Um, can you, would you mind reading me the question from the chat? So the question is, what is the difference between acceptance testing and you, you usability testing? Yeah, great question. Um, they're, they're no different in my mind. You could get a lot of different answers for me. Um, we talk about user acceptance testing. Some teams feel that is a specific requirement. And so what I'm trying to do at Boeing is make the two synonymous because what I'm seeing is if you, if, so you're gonna learn about functional testing a little bit. Functional testing is I have some software. Let me click around and make sure the software works according to how I told the developers to code it. That's functional testing essentially. So, right, please click the green button 
click green button. And a pop-up should appear, pop-up, and that's functional testing, check, 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 right? So the issues I'm seeing at Boeing are user acceptance testing is doing all of that, but letting a user do it. And that's killing me because we're wasting opportunities to get the user's perspective on how the software works for them, not us telling them how to use it, it's us measuring how they want and need to use it or how they perceive it to work. And if that matches up with how we intended it. So great question. Any others? I pulled my slides up, by the way, too, on my other computer. So they're bigger now. Okay, good. So my tips for the class in the user research phase that's going on on your product, I want to empower you guys to ask to observe user research. You're not always going to get invited, right? So I want to empower you to ask, is this happening? Can I come watch one or two? Again, you don't need to watch every single one, but it's really nice to get a break and uh, just, just watch. That's so really great that John has already participated. Uh, you've represented as a user probably then. Okay, yeah. So when I'm conducting usability testing, I'm always inviting observers. That's the product team. They sit very quietly and they just listen and I run the show. And then after we talk about what we saw, um, and then just another note here, sometimes we'll be on a very large dev team, there will be many developers, and uh, don't hog all the user research, make sure you're sharing the love, take turns. <laughs> PM's being quiet. <laughs> yes, that's, that's the fun. Um, you are, what does URIX stand for? I'm not sure I'm familiar with that acronym. I'm not either, actually. User Research International? Oh, Oh no, oh, I, I do all my own. Yep, that's all me. Uh, all my UX designers are full stack, which means they support their entire user-centered design life cycle by themselves. Uh, I do have lots of you know business partners, um, business architects, lots of huge network to make sure you know we're accessing the factory uh, participants. But yeah, it's all, if you think about it, user research is very proprietary to your company. You're doing it internal to your company. So we definitely don't want to be sharing all those secrets with uh, other companies, but thanks for asking. All right. Doing really good on time. <laughs> yeah. um, make sure you're yeah, taking turns, sharing the love, you know, just head out, head out one, see one or two design studio. All right. Uh, again, the fun time, we're collaborating, we're jamming on design. Um, like I said, I want you guys there to have fun. I want you to participate in the fun first. I want you to get out of your analytical brain for an hour and just have abstract thought. Anything goes, sky's the limit, green field, anything, like nothing's off the table. And then at the very end of my design studio, I'll go, okay, Dev, let's hear it. What things are absolutely can't happen? You can't do it too hard. Like, give me, give me the truth. And uh, that way you're not like Debbie Downing the whole design studio. I really, I always schedule time for you at the very end. Um, so I'll, again, I will empower you guys. Ask to participate in design studio ask to provide feasibility recommendations, but please leave it to the end. <laughs> Let us have our fun. Let us think about all the possibilities ever. And then you can lay on us the, uh, the hard truths of difficult code. And uh, that's, that's, how we, that's how we work together. <laughs> all right, next up is requirements package. So you have your design, it's pretty awesome. It's testing well with the users. Right, that's that iterative, you do some design, well then you're testing. Okay, now we gotta package it all up to send it to code. So once again, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm not necessarily leading it, I'm more like pairing with product. But again, we need you guys in here to make sure what we're writing makes sense, it's clear, it's feasible, and it's testable. So again, we have a lot of different types of tests we're gonna be doing on this software, but my big goal is to make sure I can conduct usability testing at the end, uh, closer to launch, and I can verify with data that this software will be successful. So it's a big effort. A uh, few more tips here for you guys. So 
empowering you once again make sure you're partnering with product and design i'm sharing with you guys kind of the ideal state and why i keep saying ask to do this make sure you're included is because not like no product development team is perfect and completely a well-oiled machine and so there are times where i'm doing user research i won't think to ask to bring a developer on to watch you know so these are things I hope you're thinking about um, as you move forward in your careers to um, ensure user-centered design is happening all over the place. So tips also include, hey, did you know you do not have to accept user stories to work if the uh, success criteria is not clear, if the feature description is not clear, if there's no acceptance criteria? I'm, I'm fighting fires at Boeing all over the place when they're sending over half baked user stories and then the developers accept them and start working on them. And then they have 30 emails worth of questions. And it's like, it's killing our velocity. If we could just have the developers say, this is not enough information for me to get started. Please like go back and like work more on it. I feel like that would be so much more productive and it would really um, reduce the frustration on development, especially consider this, we have a lot of developers who are working in India. So that's a completely 12 hour time difference. So if they have a question for me, it's gonna be waiting 12, like 24 hours or more to get back to them. And then they, they have more questions. So that's why I'm advocating for quick um, meetings, which is actually the next slide, but hold on. Um, Pre-IPM is another great uh, oh, way yeah. to ensure that you're, um, user stories are clear and they're, they're sliced correctly. So you guys can help um, provide guidance on how I'm slicing the UI design to um, help you code it in an easy way. All right, dev design pairing is a better way to get quick uh, questions answered from design or product um, instead of sending 30 emails around. So I prefer a quick meeting, I wanna go check out how you guys have been coding stuff and make sure it's, it's looking like my design. It's looking like my mock, right? Uh, I'm having a lot of challenges at Boeing right now with developers sending out code and accepting it without us. And we're very alarmed when we see the design months later. We're like, this doesn't look anything like I designed it. Well, we should probably be having more tag ups. So I wanna encourage you guys to invite your designer into your coding sessions. It's gonna be like a quick 30 minute meeting. Get a few of your questions out of the way. Help them help you make you look pretty. I know some of you don't like working with JavaScript or CSS. Uh, you know who you are, you can be silent. <laughs> but uh, you know, I do care about font and I do care about this specific width of the border. So when you're eyeballing it, um, that's okay. I wanna come in and say, hey, that needs to be five pixels, not three pixels. Those are really quick, fast changes. So I prefer to get those tweaks out of the way with you um, before it goes to acceptance. Uh, final set of tips, UAT. Uh, again, kind of talked to this a little bit. Um, Basically, I just want you guys to continue to be curious about your users always. Continue to ask questions of design, of product. If you feel like you're out of the loop on what the users are feeling or needing to do, just speak up. Just ask. Ask to participate. Ask to uh, help out where you can. Um, so, yeah, that's those are... Those are my big my big tips. Um, any questions so far before I go into the final uh, TLDR? Giving software to folks that didn't participate in its that don't really have an idea how it was sort of intended to be used, like in the way a developer would. Yeah, I've been on the on the pointy end of folks saying, well, I didn't know I shouldn't have clicked there. And they did. And things blew up quickly or they got yeah. into blind alleys. And yeah, that expect some of that because it's going to happen. And better you, it happens earlier rather than after it's been delivered 
and is in the hands of people. Yeah. Yeah, so. absolutely. That's that's the funnest part of my job. It's it's we will always be wrong. Let's approach software design and development as we know nothing. Everything is an assumption and the users guide and validate our direction. And so I never ever go into user testing with this is how it should work. My goal is always I need to make the software act exactly as the user expects it. And that's what my prototypes help me to learn. All right, let's jump into TLDR. Uh, I was going to call this um, too boring, didn't listen, but I didn't think that would <laughs> make any, I don't know, it didn't, I didn't think it would test well. So anyway, <laughs> TLDR, I want you guys to come away from this presentation and be UX champions. So there are three main ways you are now qualified to be a UX champion. Number one, you are informed. So you have been encouraged and empowered to make sure your product development team is taking a user always first mentality. That's, you know, my always, I live and breathe users, but product and dev also have a huge responsibility to make sure we're always focused on the users. Um, UCD buys down the risk of our software failing on launch. Mm -hmm. And um, if we can just all rally around that great truth, life would be so much easier. Uh, but I'm constantly educating people constantly. All my UX designers are as well. They are very tired. Sometimes I have to always boost up their energy. Like, hey, my product, does, my product manager did not understand that she assigned me too many features for this sprint and then kept shuffling my priorities around. Um, and I keep telling her she, she probably still doesn't fully understand our capability or what we need to be doing, all it takes to validate a user requirement. So keep fighting the good fight. Um, and then finally, we do not demo to end users ever. That's like one key thing I want you guys to take away from here. We do not demo our code to end users. It is a missed opportunity to understand their perception of the software. Why? Because we're giving them the answers in advance. Remember, we go back to what Chris just said about them using it incorrectly. I never want to be the person in charge of teaching users how to use it. It's my job to make it as seamless and easy to use and out of the way as possible so they can just do their job. Number two, you guys are UX champions because I've taught you the technical aspects of user-centered design. We talked about user research, you wanna get invited. Design studio, you wanna get invited. User story, you wanna get invited. Design dev pairing, please include design. <laughs> and then persuasive, hopefully you're pumped up about user-centered design now and you will go forth and share the love. I linked I've, I've actually linked tons of things in the resources backup slides, but my particular favorite video here is the ROI of UX. Uh, definitely give that a, a, a listen. Um, the end goal for our software is always user adoption. If we've spent millions of dollars on coding something and nobody wants to use it, we've wasted all of our money. And you specifically as my developers do not want to be throwing away your code that, that cheapens the value you bring to the team. So we all care about not throwing away software and really focusing on proving our users' lives. So um, part of being a UX champion is making sure our team is focused on the software investment. Are we spending money in the right places? Or are we half-assing user stories and designs to get them to code really fast? You'll find that happens a lot. Teams are more concerned about the speed of development. And that is killing me because that means we're skipping user testing or we're skipping a really sound design studio with a proper amount of user representation. Yeah, the if economics you of, particularly at a company the size, size of Boeing, you know, you scale up the cost of small 
mistakes in usability across tens of thousands of users, then you start to work out, okay, so what did, what did that actually cost us? And when we've done that, it tends, the numbers get big enough. It gets, it has often gotten management's attention in a real hurry because now it's not just a minute here and a minute there. It's thousands of minutes every day forever. Absolutely. Uh, so finally, um, if user-centered design activities are not happening on your product team, I want you to ask why. I want you to empower the team to figure it out. They're all called something similar to what I just shared with you, like user acceptance testing, usability testing, uh, user research versus user interviews versus observations. Um, go ask why. There's no reason you should be putting out high-risk software when we all know how to do user-centered design now. We know how to observe and ask good questions. Um, my job and all of our jobs is to buy down the chance of user adoption failure. And so these are some areas where you guys can help. So let's all get together and improve the lives of our users. Thanks so much for, uh, for having me today. Any other questions? No, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So I'm like 99% sure I want to go into product management, but I've really fallen in love with UX research. Um, what if I'm torn between the two as far as like in my career? Like, are there like ways to sort of figure out like if you would be better at one over the other or? Um, sure, so uh, how many UX um, classes have you taken so far? A few. Awesome, and then how far away are you from graduating? Um, next quarter. Ah, congrats. So you're probably starting to apply already for those different kinds of jobs. Yeah. Um, so a little bit of it comes down to what's open, who's hiring. Um, it's great that you have, you're kind of splitting. That's, that's awesome. That's um, where a lot of us hang out because if I don't have a good product manager, I'm really fending for myself on my project, doing all the PM stuff. That's not an ideal situation, but um, I, I think my first inclination is, figure out what job that you're applying to sounds like the most fun. And then you have your whole career to go back and forth and move around. So don't feel like you are completely locked in on that first job that you apply for because I'm, I mentored nine designers this week. And one of them told me, I think I might want to go into product management. And it was funny because in that same breath, he had literally just told me that he wanted to focus more on visual design than user research. And I was like, but product starts earlier towards user research. And then, you know, we get into the design work. So I was like, you're kind of contradicting yourself there a little bit. Um, but I think whatever sounds like the most fun for you to start is, so product management is going to be more working with customers, figuring out the priorities for the product, figuring out the business needs, business capability mapping, um, a lot of politics. <laughs> I do a lot of politics too, actually. But uh, yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, thank you so much. Anyone else? Okay. Anybody else? Also, say generally while someone else is coming up with a question that. Most UX designers, you need to have a portfolio to demonstrate your work. A lot of UX design jobs are going to require some sort of website that you demonstrate your user-centered design process and your design work. So keep that in mind. PM may be a little easier to initially um, jump into if you're on the fence, and then you can build up your portfolio over time. Okay. Thank you very much for your time. I, I really appreciate it.